I'm going to say about hidden treasures in the Court of Common Pleas. And because I worked at the Ohio Genealogical Society for 37 years, most of my examples are from Ohio. But these types of items that you find in this particular record group are going to be common to Indiana in many other states. Some background information first on common pleas, particularly in Ohio, and you'll have to study your own state or the state where your ancestors resided to see what uh, the dates are. Statehood in Ohio is in 1803, and common pleas records exist from that time, and actually they exist from prior to that time with the Northwest Territory records. They're found in the clerk of court's office today. They include basically cases of law and equity. Equity basically means the division of things that people own. You'll find a lot of land partition records. You'll find divorces in that type of thing. And also you'll find criminal matters in common pleas. And that's sometimes the most interesting. Uh, in Ohio, probate court was not formed until 1852. Uh, so your standard genealogical records would have occurred in common pleas court. Things like marriages and wills and estates and guardianships, probate records. In most counties, uh, the mar early marriages and the early wills uh, were pulled from the clerk of court's office once uh, probate started, and those materials were moved from uh, common pleas court to probate court. Uh, but in some counties, those early records prior to 1852 are still in the clerk of court, even though you might think of them as a probate record today. So you can find a, a wide array of items in common pleas. States were organized in different ways in Ohio. This is the chart for the organization of the county courts in 1810. Basically, you have the commissioner and treasurer on one side, sheriff and coroner on the other side. Uh, the surveyor, recorder, prosecuting attorney, clerk of courts were all under the judge of common pleas. By 1853, a lot of these offices uh, were independent, and they still uh, basically are today. The, the three county commissioners have some control over them, but uh, most offices can do what they want other than, of course, they follow state guidelines of how to record records and that type of thing. Uh, but the Court of Common Pleas is one of those offices. Clerk of Courts is over here, Coroner is over here. All these are tied to Common Pleas records. There's really a chain of command when you have court cases. Uh, civil cases, criminal cases. In Ohio's early history and the early history of other states, uh, there would be a justice of the peace in a township. If it was a populated township, uh, there might be two or three or four or five justices of the peace, and they would keep journals and they would hear cases. If the case, for example, was a debt case and it was more than $50, it might go up to uh, the county common pleas court. Uh, divorces often go up to the county common pleas court instead of being handled by the justice of the peace. Criminal actions uh, depends on the type of crime. If you get a more serious crime, it's going to go to the county common pleas court. So you've got a, a set of records that are basically what we call common pleas records that are at a very local level kept by the justice of the peace, and you'll find those in the control of township officers today. And then you've got common pleas on the county level, and those records are in the clerk of court's office today. And then you've got an appeal system, and that's the one that really changed in Ohio. You want to check in Indiana and other states. Three, a circuit court followed that for a number of years, and then in 1912, uh, the Court of Appeals, and it's still called that today, was formed. What these uh, higher courts were, if, if the case was more serious, uh, if there were countersuits and so forth that would pop up to these higher courts. And they were generally, in, in the larger counties, they, they, they were there permanently, but in most areas of Ohio, uh, the court was held four times a year. And it could have been a week long, it just depending on the number of cases. Uh, but often you'll find uh, cases in March, uh, June, August, November, and the packets will be arranged by those dates. The, the uh, letters that give the court schedules and so forth will be arranged by those dates. And then you also have a mayor's court 
uh, in uh, small towns, large towns, and then a criminal court comes in later. And all these courts will, will handle uh, some of the records or some of the cases that, that we'll be looking at in a few minutes. There's all kinds of records in common pleas court. You have journals, minute books, judgment records, criminal records, civil records, chancery. Those That would include the divorces, partitions, appearance dockets, order books, execution dockets, assignment dockets, bench dockets, complete records, cost bills. You know, look on Google to, to figure out what all these things are. It can be very confusing and you got to read these cases closely. But the basic process is you've got an appearance docket which is basically the court schedule. And then you've got uh, the minutes uh, or the journal, uh, which would have a record of what went on in the court, who the attorneys were and so forth. You have the execution docket, which basically gives the decision of the court, what the penalties were, what the charges were to uh, the person that lost the case. Sometimes that's called a law record. Sometimes it's called a final record. It depends on the county and the time period. And then you have a case file. The case files don't all survive uh, in Ohio's counties, and I'm that sh sure that's true everywhere. Uh, they may survive for a certain time period. That, that's the type of thing that they'll often show off in, into uh, uh, local museums or local genealogical society collections or local libraries. Common police case files certainly don't survive as, as much as your estate packets, which are also case files for probate court. So the appearance docket is mentioned is the index to all cases coming before the court. Uh, the minutes basically gives the, the synopsis of the cases. Uh, the counties are supposed to preserve their court minutes or court journals for common pleas permanently. So while the packets are often destroyed, the courts generally do have the journals unless they had a fire or something. Execution dockets gives the decision and the case files have the original uh, paperwork often in, including the pleas made by the plaintiff, the pleas made by the defendant, the testimony of witnesses that can be very helpful genealogically and then the evidence in the cases. How do you find out uh, what exists in the various divisions of common pleas. Uh, this is a really dated uh, book, uh, but the Ohio County Records Manual is online now at ohiohistory.org, the Ohio History Connections website, our state archives. Uh, so you want to look at the old online version of this, but this is the page uh, when it was in, in book form. And it basically tells each uh, type of case and then says how they're generally arranged and what type of information is found in those dockets or that record type, and then how long they're supposed to keep them. So for example, here's judgment docket, dockets, lien dockets. They only have to keep them for five years after the last judgment is released in that particular journal. We might want, genealogically speaking, uh, is preserved or has to be preserved by the court. We're actually lucky if things are preserved. Uh, some of the odd things that pop up in common pleas, and we'll look at a lot of these, coroner's inquest records, uh, declaration of intentions moved back between common pleas, the clerk of court's office, and the uh, probate office in Ohio. Naturalization, same type of thing. Uh, all your licenses, tavern licenses, peddlers, embalming licenses, explosive auctioneers, ferries, optometry, there's all kinds of things that you'll find in the clerk of court's office. Uh, quadrennial enumerations. Ohio has a, a large number of those. They're, they're kept at the county level. You don't see them at a statewide institution. Uh, but basically, it's a, a, a very basic census uh, taken every four years uh, that uh, notes the number of males over age 21. Uh, you've got jury lists. You've got earmarks and brands, stray notices, sometimes called estrays trademarks and patents, mother's pensions, divorce, dissolution, alimony, minister's licenses, another record group that started off in common pleas. And then when probate court was formed in 1851, the minister's licenses were kept by probate court because that's where the marriages were recorded after that 1851 date here in Ohio. Uh, Revolutionary War, War of 1812, uh, they would get help from the court uh, in applying for pensions. You'll, you'll see those in the county records sometimes. More often, you'll see them in the local township justice of the peace records. 
uh, debt cases, insolvency, and wills, estates, and administrations prior to the formation of probate court in 1852. Some interesting uh, tidbits, naturalizations are in the Common Pleas Journal until about 1859. So even though probate was formed in 1852, they waited a few years to switch. Then they're with probate court until 1895, then they jump back to, to uh, Common Pleas Court. So you've got to look in various offices depending on the time period. 1906, it becomes federal, and your packets, if they still exist, are often transferred to the National Archives in Chicago. With the Act of 1818, revolutionary soldiers could apply for pensions through common police court. Uh, in 1820, they were required to uh, say what kind of personal property they had. Property they, had. Uh, they had to know what their uh, worth was in, in life. 1832 uh, applications begin appearing in the Supreme Court journals. Uh, 1803, with Ohio statehood, uh, common pleas held jurisdiction in civil cases when the sum was greater uh, than $35. So if it was less than $35, uh, it would be the justice of the peace. If it was over, over $35, common pleas. I think I mentioned $50 before, but that sum getting larger and larger. Uh, Supreme Court had jurisdiction to real property uh, if it, the dispute exceeded a thousand dollars. And by Supreme Court, I don't mean a state Supreme Court. I mean the Supreme Court that met met four times a year at the county level. That traveled; those judges traveled in and traveled from county to county. Um, after 1851, the Supreme Court only sat in Columbus. So, and that is basically the same time that uh, probate court. Uh, was formed. Um, the WPA records can also be helpful in locating uh, at least what existed at the time that those inventories were made between 1936 and 1941 in, in your particular county. Uh, the WPA did work not in all counties of Ohio, but in a lot of them. Ohio University has a collection, Western Reserve Historical Society has a collection, Ohio History Connection, Columbus does. Uh, they uh, published 47 volumes on the county level, but they did a lot more volumes uh, for municipal records in cities, but it's the county records that we're interested in. And this is what a page looks like. Uh, so here's a section under common pleas under the Kerwicker Court's office, and here's trial and argument lists, and it tells about issue dockets, exists from 1797 on. This almost must be, well, it says Green County. I didn't realize they were that early. Uh, trial dockets of common pleas, 16 volumes, motion and argument calendars, Green County, 1863, 17 volumes. It's kind of neat to know what the county had uh, back during the Depression years, and, and then you're lucky if those volumes still exist in the county today. Uh, here, for example, in more details, the inventory of the uh, county records by the WPA for Summit County. Uh, which is basically the city of Akron. It's uh, 322 pages long, so it's not a short inventory, and they have theirs available uh, digitally. And here's a section on clerk courts, on the Court of Common Pleas, on the Supreme Court, on the Court of Appeals. And you can see these sections are quite lengthy if you look at the page numbers, but it gives all the details of what you'll find in those records. And here's an example, civil court calendar, criminal court calendar, 69 volumes in Summit County. So uh, even the, the the strangest records in common pleas take up a lot of space to store. Uh, original papers are what we would love to find if they still exist. Uh, at this time during the Depression, Summit County still had 2,814 feet of uh, civil case packets beginning in 1840 and 154 feet of criminal case packets beginning in 1840 uh, when Summit County uh, became a county. If those exist, you know, hunt for them. Uh, unfortunately, Summit County uh, ditched a lot of their records. Uh, we had a, a lady uh, who was active in the chapter there from OGS, and she ended up having these in her garage for a number of years. And when she passed away, they ended up at the Ohio Genealogical Society where I worked. Uh, I tell the kids when they come through on tours that Summit County had a lot of executions but uh, back in the day, but execution dockets, again, are uh, the decisions of the court in common pleas cases. So these date 1847, 1845, 1851, up through the 1870s. 
Um, and then I did an inventory here. Uh, we got these through the will of Marilyn Kovach. Uh, she had all these volumes in her garage, but at least they didn't get thrown out uh, when she died in 2000. And there's even indexes to marriages there, a Carroll Town County Justice of the Peace book. Um, good things uh, turn up in odd places sometimes. And you got to read the old writing when you look at these journals. Uh, here is uh, an example from some of those come at, uh, Summit County Common Pleas records here. We have John McMillan and his attorney versus George uh, Wellhouse, and it names his attorney. And it gives the costs along the left column and then what happened along the right-hand side. Another example, the state of Ohio versus Thomas Russell and Alexander Ferris. Uh, often if the state of Ohio is involved, it can sometimes be a criminal record, not always, and I'm not sure what it is in this case here, but the basic point of this is you got to be able to read uh, the detail uh, because it can be hidden away in this. This is the July term of 1880 case for burglary and larceny, and it's entered in uh, the volume 22 of the journals, but this is a uh, transcription of what happened in the case. The earlier common pleas records are some of the most interesting. This is a case here from my direct ancestor, Andrew Ritchie in 1817. And the person who sorted this noted the date at the top. It was 1870. The case was heard in the June term of the court and it's case number one. Uh, but it's the Bank of Worcester versus Andrew Ritchie. And you may or may not have heard of the Wildcat Banks in Ohio. These were banks that uh, popped up on the frontier at that time, and uh, the pioneers that came in that were buying land from the United States government uh, borrowed money, even though the land was $1.25 an acre at that time, maybe $2 at one point an acre. Uh, they still had to get loans from the bank and my ancestor. And Andrew Ritchie got a loan from the Bank of Worcester, and uh, the bank failed uh, or was starting to fail, and they were calling uh, the loans. So they wanted Andrew to pay up instead of paying over time. So that's what this particular case was about. You want to pay attention to the witnesses. On this particular one, it also lists the jurors. But sometimes the witnesses are family members of the plaintiff. On this side, up at the top, it's got the defendant's witnesses, and then it lists them out. On the right-hand side, it's got the plaintiff's witnesses, and then it's got, or at the bottom, it's got sworn witnesses on the part of the plaintiff. So pay attention to those names. It can really help for a name like Smith uh, to sort out which Smiths are your family and which Smiths might be another. So look at the, the uh, back of the case file and see who, who uh, spoke up in the court case. Some examples of some average cases in some of the journals, Jacob Hutchins versus Samuel Boltus, a bill in Chancery, James Burnside versus William Andrews, an action, a piece. Sometimes it doesn't tell you what the case is actually about. Gilkinson versus Laughlin, an action of slander. Levering versus Wyrick, writ of error. It was settled uh, before it went to court. Sally Schaefer versus Peter Schaefer petition for divorce. Uh, so some, John at the bottom, James Miller versus Nancy Miller petition for divorce, 1817. Uh, a final record, this is an example of what that looks like, a title of the case, who needs to get paid, who the attorneys were and so forth, and then basically uh, what happened, judgment by confession of the defendant uh, in person for cost of suit. Uh, and what uh, it was, uh, volume page it was filed in. Uh, here's another one of my ancestors. This is my paternal line, Henry O'Neill. I, I love timelines uh, when I'm doing my personal genealogy. And uh, luckily, Henry was in court a lot. And I can just chart him out. 1800, June, he is um, something about property. June 1803, uh, assaulting, biting, wounding, uh, and ill-treating the plaintiff. September of the same month, the uh, general revenue guy has gone after him for $36, on and on and on. Here he's taking whiskey and rye meal. You can get a, a good record of your ancestor if they happen to be uh, a little on, out, out of line with the neighbors and so forth. This is what a bundle of common pleas records looks like if it has not been unfolded by genealogical society volunteers or the archivist in the particular institution that holds it. 
Uh, this is uh, Supreme Court cases. So this, I can see that on the side. I can't quite read the year here, but I'm guessing it's 1830s. Uh, and this would be one term. So this would be March term or, or June term or September term or the November term. And these were all the cases heard. And when you get a packet like this, um, you can bet that no one has looked at this packet since 1836 or whatever year this might be. Uh, this is what the packets were in Richland County when we had volunteers unfold them at the Ohio Genealogical Society. And then once they're unfolded, you put them in standard acid-free files and hopefully you get an index up online so that people have a way to know that those cases are in, in your possession. Some of the processes leading to a case file, the attorney files a plea for an action on behalf of his client or the state of Ohio is the plaintiff in criminal cases. The clerk of courts will assign a case number. Now, the early cases don't have case numbers, so you've got to pay attention to uh, the title of the case. And then there's subsequent filings by attorneys and uh, witnesses to the court and so on that uh, are placed in the packet. This is kind of a short case study. Holgate versus Van Fossen is the title of the case, Richland County, Ohio. Can't remember the year, but it's I think it's in the 1820s. The whole suit is about the William Trucks family that founded the town of Trucksville. So this case is historically important because it's their founding family. The town is now called Ganges in Richland County, Ohio, but it was originally named after the Trucks family. And all the family members and the neighbors all come in and give their opinion of what happened. So they're interviewing people and they sign their name to it. We find out in these cases that people are not nice to each other. Uh, they are rattling on, on each other. It identifies relationships. If the brother is testifying, it will say that. Sometimes it will give the parents' names and it will give all kinds of details. And in this Holgate versus Ben Poposin case, I, I wrote an article on this for the Ohio Genealogical Society Quarterly a long time ago. Uh, but this case started out in common pleas and then was shoved up to Supreme Court and there were still papers in both courts. Uh, so you may have to look. And it may have started at the Justice of the Peace level. You may have to look at several different courts to get the whole story of what happened in a common pleas case. In the OGS library, this is Richland County, so I'll go through it really quickly. But you want to see if indexes have been made, and they're all a little bit different. On the right-hand side, we had a volunteer at OGS, Mary Jane Hinney, who did hand abstracts of each case. And at the top, she wrote the year, uh, the, the month of the packet, and the uh, this in this case is the 47th case in the packet. And there's di four doc documents, actual documents, which she labeled A through D. And then another volunteer came along and then made an index of all those, which which refers to the volume and page number of Mrs. Hinney's handwritten abstracts. And then uh, this is an example of a close-up of one of her abstracts, which she gives all the, the uh, important people that are named in the case. If it refers to land, she'll give a land description and so forth. And this is a cl close-up of the uh, transcript or the index was that was made of that case. And then uh, there's actually another index after that once it was computerized. So you may have three different steps in the process of finding the case. So check, check with whoever uh, did the work in your particular county. Uh, we'll look at some examples of some of the items that you might find in common pleas. This is back to my family. This is in my town where I still live, New London uh, Township here in County, Ohio. My ancestor, Benjamin Ford White, has died. And on the left-hand side, his widow, uh, Elizabeth, gets her widow's dower. And then the seven daughters get uh, shares of the land. 20 acres, 21 acres, 23 acres, 24 acres. It, the, it depends on how good that land was. The worst land, that person got more. On the right-hand side, usually partition records are mentioned in the newspaper. This is another family member, the Tanners. And one, uh, this is a lot, usually called a friendly lawsuit, although it's not always friendly. But in 1835, one of the children, Sally Tanner, and another child, Amy Tanner Powers, filed a petition to sue all the other brothers and sisters, and they asked the court to divide the land up evenly, equitably. This is a deposition of David Williams on Patrick George and taken at the dwelling house of said David uh, Williams on the 18th day. Uh, of 1808, I can't see the month right there, of May. 
basically it's listing all kinds of names in this and it it says that he came in company with others in May 1774 to the place now called Harrodsburg. This is some uh, records I was looking at down in Kentucky at the State Archives in Frankfurt, and it was basically court packets of various suits, and they were trying to work out who owned land that my ancestor Peter Hendricks claimed, and a lot of other people claimed as well. So there's deposition after deposition after deposition. And uh, it's wonderful for tying a particular area together. Uh, here's an example of a chancery record, Columbiana County, Ohio, for Nancy Henry, now Nancy Taylor. So it gives her maiden name. And it, and it identifies that she has uh, children, uh, Jeremiah Taylor and Mary Taylor, who are minors. Uh, in this particular case, the divorce in this shown here in Chancery was filed in Tuscarawas County, but the marriage occurred in Columbiana County. They lived in Columbiana County, but sometimes they'll go to the next county to do the dirty work so that the locals, the neighbors don't know what's going on and the local newspapers don't pick it up. Bastardy suit, very important genealogically. Elizabeth Day, an unmarried woman in 1845, resident here in county, says she's pregnant and that the child is born alive will be a bastard and that Perry Coleman is the father of said child. Perry Coleman is my uncle way back, so that's important to me genealogically. He won the case. Uh, she lost the case, so he didn't have to pay anything. But I do have a picture of the child that was born, and she kind of looks like Coleman, and I need to do the DNA work, find some descendants. I'm pretty sure she probably is a child of, of uh, my ancestor. This is the Lindley Tavern, and I show this because it's still standing just about three miles from OGS. Our uh, attorney that we used to have, he's retired now at OGS. Mr. Slaybaugh had his offices in this building. But I show it because all these taverns, old taverns, had to have licenses. And this is an example of the license for this tavern that I just pictured. Uh, at this time, it was owned by Mr. Mrs. E.D. Lindsley. Her husband had passed away. And all the, the people who used the tavern, the neighbors of the tavern, residents of that township, had to sign or sign the petition if they thought it was a good thing, if they were not opposed to having a tavern in the town of Lexington where travelers would stay. And of course, they would probably serve alcohol and things like that, serve meals. Uh, but you'll find those in common police packets. Here's a guardianship uh, from common police records. That would be probate later on, but it was still uh, filed in common police in this case for Elizabeth White, guardian Elizabeth S. White. This kind of goes with that partition record that I showed you earlier. Immigration records. This is Edward Enderby age 50 years old, native of England, all handwritten in the common pleas journals. Uh, they would file a declaration of intent first, then a petition, then the individual would get receive a naturalization certificate. Of course, the modern ones after 1906 are at the National Archives, Great Lakes Branch in Chicago. But this is 1833 when it was still common pleas. Uh, they moved back and forth between common pleas and probate court even, back to common pleas and so forth. Here's examples of more modern ones. This is a gentleman from, it looks like, Greece, who immigrated to Richland County, Ohio, in common police court record. And I'm trying to find the date on here. It looks like 1884, uh, or that was his birth date. I think the record here is a little bit later. But of course, you get typed for him, but, but they're still kept in journals of common police court. And these later ones, this is 1929, have uh, pictures often affixed to these uh, naturalization records. This is what a quadrennial enumeration looks like. Uh, the earlier ones are just basic. It just gives the name of the male over age 21 that lived in a particular township. So there'd be a quadrennial enumeration in Perry County in 1847. There'd be another one in 1851. There'd be another one in 1855. You just have to keep adding four years. And they went up into the 1900s before they quit doing it. Uh, some counties have kept uh, all the names listed. Other counties, uh, just where I live in here in county, they just did totals. So it just says there are 200 people that live in the township that are males over age 21, doesn't give their names. Or perhaps there were names at one time, but they were disposed of. But uh, what we have now are just totals. These are road petitions that you'll sometimes find in common. Please, here they are laying out a road. And the people that live along that future road 
need to sign on that. In some cases, they'll be doing some of the road work and they get credit on their taxes for that. But usually the first person that signed is the one who heads this road request, the request for money to get a road built. And often the name is, uh, the road is named after that person. So in this case, Andrew Newman, perhaps this road was named Newman Road. Not always, but that's often the case. Stray records are found sometimes in common pleas. So we got Robert McDermott uh, in Monroe Township, Richland County in 1843 has uh, recovered a cow. And the reason they have to do this is because they don't want to be accused of stealing that cow. And then it's uh, advertised with the local justice of the peace or the county official. And they pass that information around and hopefully find the owner of that cow. And then that owner of that cow has to supply Mr. McDermott with some money to cover his feed and, and lodging that he provided for that cow in the period that he had that stray cow in his possession. Earmarks and brands go with stray records. That's how they identify which farmer owned which cow if it did get loose. And each farmer uh, had its own symbol. And you'll see those sometimes in those common police records early on. Here's a wolf scalp, and they don't, they're not real common. This is Richland County's Jefferson County, Ohio is an excellent set. Uh, but they're, they're they're really early records. This one is 1813. And here Scott Durbin of Richland County Madison Township is saying that he has uh, captured three wolf scalps and he gets $12. So they're $4 a piece. That's a lot of money in 1813. But wolves were dangerous to livestock. I've heard stories of them arming or killing children even. And we have wolves moving back into our area in Ohio now. Uh, minister's license, I mentioned that they started out in common pleas ledgers and they uh, went to probate court in 1851 when that was formed. Uh, but here we've got a minister, Hiram Schaefer, and he is a deacon of the Methodist Episcopal Church. And he originally got his, his uh, minister's license in Worcester, Wayne County in 1834. And here he is apply, applying in Richland County, uh, looks like maybe the next year or so, to perform marriages in Richland County also. Criminal records, this is later on, 1907. You'll see that uh, if court cases are still in their packets and common pleas, there's often a color scheme. And I don't know if this is true of every county, if, if every county had criminal uh, cases in red, but uh, Richland County that we uh, sorted at OGS, uh, their cases were in red and another uh, civil cases were in blue. I think there were there were different colors for each type of case. So some of the things on this packet, assault and battery, robbery, rape, horse stealing, um, all kinds of things. And it gives the details of the case inside. Bigamy, Richland County Common Pleas, uh, State of Ohio versus Emmer Straw. And it basically says that Emmer Straw was married on the 21st day of April, 1890 in Columbiana County to a Mary Ingle, Ingle side, Ingle thing. It, it kind of runs off into my picture there. And then later on, he was married in 1891 in Richland County, Ohio to Rebecca Turney or Turry, Turney, Turry. So he's got two wives at the same time. Ingle do is her name. I see that down below. So that's kind of interesting if you find that about an ancestor. And later on, each uh, record type gets more uh, formal. So there's various parts for a bigamy case, and they're all pretty standard printed forms, and they're all folded up in the packet. So you get a transcript from the docket, affidavit, or state warrant. State warrant that the uh, sheriff has to go out and bring in witnesses and so forth. The criminals arrested in jail, minimus penny trial, trial, pleas and affidavits, minimus after trial, and then they all turn in their fees for payment, the different parties involved in handling the case. Here's an example of minimus after trial, and it basically is explaining what is going on in the case, what happened. In this case, Emmer Straw married two individuals, and it says that he was uh, committed to jail. So it's basically the decision after trial is what that Latin word possibly means. I did not look it up. Uh, civil case uh, packet for 1864. Uh, just an example. Uh, this is Charles Bowles, guardian of Jacob Wolf, who is an insane person. And he is suing uh, Jacob Wolf Jr., the defendant. Uh, surely it's over money to care for this insane individual. 
And uh, there's a petition filed uh, that Wolf is indebted to 1820 uh, and is using the real estate that the plaintiff owns, the representative of the plaintiff. And then there's a minute answer that Wolf has no knowledge of the payment and that Wolf Jr. sold the bull and two heifers with no authority and it goes back and forth. Uh, Bowles, the guardian, asks for a motion. Uh, there's a summons to the sheriff. Uh, there's a 50 cent revenue stamp on the back. So you can tell that well, that Civil War period, if there's a revenue stamp, and it surely is 1862, 1863. Um, so there, you got to look at each piece of paper and try and figure out what is going on. Here's a mechanic lien. In other words, uh, they borrowed money in order to build a home for $7,500, 1864. And basically, the uh, construction person did not complete the home, and the uh, owner, builder, or the person who was one of the house built is uh, suing. Uh, so here's a bill of materials, all the materials that the, oh, well, actually, it was probably the construction person that wasn't, that didn't get paid in this case, but he's listing all the, the price of the timber and the windows and rafters, things like that. And it's right in this case. And then there's details of the house. Uh, the measurement, how long the timbers to be, uh, how how big the windows are to be, uh, what the windows are in the half story that was on the top part. Uh, story, the houses were one and a half stories because it was a tax break. A two-story house was often more. But you get all kinds of details about the building of that house in the lawsuit, which is kind of neat. Here's an 1864 civil case. And you can see all these Coltmans are listed here. And then women who were Coltmans initially that were married, uh, these cases uh, really throw families together. Maybe the parent uh, never had a will listing the children. Maybe you haven't found the family Bible. But if you find a lawsuit like this involving the estate of Joseph Coleman, uh, these are uh, most likely all his children who are involved in the case. Sometimes Joseph Coleman may not have had any kids or a wife, and these may be all his brothers and sisters. So you've got to look at uh, dates in determining that. And there's uh, another page from that particular case uh, listing all kinds of names that Susan Reed is married to Jacob Reed, and there's grandchildren, Samuel Elsie Coltman, George Coleman, Johnny Coltman, etc. Very great genealogically if you find a lawsuit uh, over uh, land or money in an estate. And here's something in Madison Township, Richland County, Gilbert Height or Haight. Uh, this is 1814, and it basically deals with force and arms did feloniously take out of said mill two bushels of flour, uh, the property of uh, Samuel Hart or Hunt. That can be important because it tells you that that grist mill was in operation in 1814. In this case might be more historically. The grist mill was owned by Jacob Beam, so Beam's Mill. So you want to look at these cases because you can get little tidbits of local history from them as well. This is another one of my relatives. My relatives get into trouble a lot. This is another Uncle John H. Ritchie. And he, this is a question uh, that the justice of the peace in this time, but this is from uh, county records. In a bastardy case in 1831, was asking the girl, where were you and John H. Ritchie when this transaction took place with with you. I like that word transaction. Answer at Samuel Ritchie's house. Question, did John H. Ritchie promise to marry you at that time that this took place? He did. So you get a lot of the details. Of course, that marriage never occurred and a child was born and so on. Here we have, in this uh, continues here, exposes that she is an unmarried woman in Washington Township, Richland County, pregnant with child in a form of born alive will be a bastard and that John H. Ritchie of said township is the father of said child. Here's another example, same family, uh, ancestor Andrew Ritchie, 1832, a set of silver teaspoons, six in number marked with the letters SP, standing for Sarah Post, uh, came up missing and they accused Andrew Ritchie of taking those spoons. So. And sometimes you'll find uh, things, I've got uh, spoons with initials similar to that, mine say AP, not SP on them, that were handed down in this particular family uh, to my grandmother and my, eventually my mom. Uh, another uh, common police case, Ann Patterson, concerning Elizabeth Sheriff. 
uh, hide your children here because they're talking about uh, slanderous, defor deformatory words. Uh, the wife of said John is a whore, uh, meaning the wife of said John is a whore, still meaning the wife of said John had a bastard and she was married and that bastard is Sarah Patterson. And Sarah Patterson, the wife of John Patterson, is a black bastard. So you get language in these cases. Um, this one, uh, a volunteer at OGS, uh, Ruth Hostetter descends from Elizabeth Sheriff, and I descend from Ann Patterson. Uh, so we had a good uh, conversation over this case when a uh, volunteer unfolded it and knew that we were related to these people. Uh, divorce law in Ohio, 1795, divorces permitted for bigamy, impotency, to adultery, extreme cruelty. 1804, the Supreme Court can handle divorce cases. In this case, it's the state court. Uh, willful absence is a reason that was added on. 1828, they could file divorce petitions in the county where the complaint resided. 1834, they added drunkenness as a reason for divorce. 1843, they moved divorces to the county Supreme Court, that case that traveled uh, from county to county. In 1843, they didn't allow appeals. But in 1870, they brought appeals back. So you need to re read the laws of Ohio with each type of record uh, to see what was going on at the time uh, that your ancestor had a uh, case such as this in court, but they can be interesting. Here's Isabella Iron, Ireland versus John Ireland, 1840, Richland County. In many pages in this estate case, this was a notice that had to appear in the local paper, but it says that the two parties were married in 1817 in Madison Township, so it gives you a date of marriage. After four months, John left home. He's been absent for 23 years, so why do we care now, 23 years later? because John had 60 acres of land and he had constructed a rough log cabin, which is now dilapidated. Isabella is now 60. She has the unmarried daughter who is dependent on her. They want to sell the land, but John, who abandoned the family, still owns that land. The woman uh, doesn't have rights at that time. But John had committed adultery with Betsy Irvine in Knox County, had children by her, had committed adultery with Elizabeth Sawyer, had admitted adultery with a third woman who was unknown to the petitioner. Plus, he's a drunkard, and Isabella just wants a divorce. So lots of stuff in these. Timothy Schaefer versus Susanna said Susanna began to treat the petitioner with severe and extreme cruelty, striking and beating him, threatening to kill him testimony by neighbors. I have frequently seen her strike him with a poker stick and raise a shovel at him, uh, rubbing her fist under his nose, and she refuses to cook for him. Uh, signed, uh, Catherine Schaefer. John White, clerk of the County Court of Hampshire. You have to prove that that marriage occurred when you're getting a divorce, so here, John Fetter and Charlotte Fout or Fote were married on the 11th day of September 1817 in Hampshire, which I think is now in West Virginia, and they are filing to for divorce in 1830 in Richland County, Ohio. But that's proof of the marriage is often in the divorce case if that packet still survives. Um, Alicia McCreeby says that uh, there were a number of people at the log rolling. Uh, and he was in bed with a certain Hezekiah Harvey. In the morning, he saw Hezekiah Harvey, Harvey left the bed, and he searched for him, and he found Hezekiah in bed with the said Charlotte Fetter, the person who uh, that the divorce is involved with. Apparently, in the act of adultery, it appeared so because uh, the motion that he saw under the clothes. Uh, Tuscarawas County, Jacob Taylor versus Nancy Taylor basically petition for divorce to the Honorable Court of Common Pleas, Tuscarawas County, Ohio, in Chancery. Uh, so pay attention to that Chancery. It doesn't have to be in the county uh, where they lived in, in certain time periods. Uh, in this case, Tuscarawas County Chancery, it's in, in the journals. Uh, there's a petition filed in Tuscarawas County. The marriage occurred 10 years earlier in Columbiana. Uh, Nancy is the one that supposedly abandoned the family, divert, deserted the family, had been gone for three years, and guilty with adultery with one Thomas Anderson, two children uh, that were minors, and so on. 
Corners and quests are in common pleas records early on. Inquest over the dead body of Robert Warfield. And my name is Edgar Applin. I'm 46 years old. I'm a guard and teacher. This is at the uh, Richland County Prison, the reformatory. And they're asking Ed Edgar Applin, uh, how long have you been with that institution? How long have you known Robert Warfield? I've known him nine months. He had been going to school. So this was a young, uh, the reformatory was for prisoners under 30 years old when it was first built. And so a lot of these were ba basically kids and they had school. Uh, it was not my grade. I have the fourth grade. He was only in the second or third grade. Knew him quite well, acquainted with his movements where I have charge of the color company and drill. He is in my company. What kind of man is he? I would class him as one of the lowest degenerates. Additional testimony, he tried to get the mace from me. He grabbed at me. Did you strike him? Yes. How did you come to shoot him? He had me backed up against the wall, the block. Basically, uh, the, the kid got a hold of his gun and were trying to get the gun and mace was involved in the person that was uh, actually a college student that was working at the Ohio Reformatory for the summer killed this uh, uh, young, very young inmate of the reformatory. And it's all detailed out in the case. Uh, here's another one. Uh, involves the Pennsylvania Railroad where uh, someone was, actually the, the, the crew of the train saw flames shooting out of a basement window of a house. And of course you can't stop a train right away, but they sent word out that the house was on fire and Mrs. Derman was caught in the house and died. So there's affidavits and witness testimony in this coroner's case. The dead body of Anna Bush. The informant is Mike Bush, who got home from work from the grain elevator. And the questions are, was the baby floating on top of the water? Yes, sir, it was. How deep is the sister? A foot and a half deep. Uh, so basically, Anna Bush was his daughter, and the father, Mike Bush, was being questioned. Uh, someone had left the sister uncovered, or somehow the baby had got, the young child had gotten into the cistern and drowned. So these coroner's in, uh, inquests are not that great or to read sometimes. They're pretty sad. Uh, this is a, a murder local to me that had a coroner's inquest, the Meach brothers. Uh, some fellas came down from Cleveland and robbed the Meach brothers. Uh, they had guns and they shot two of the guys and the other two got away and were eventually captured. But sometimes you'll find photographs in coroner's inquest records, not always, but these guys are are dead in the photographs, but their mustaches are waxed, they're put in suits and the uh, chin is propped up there for, for the photos. All kinds of laws are published at the state level. So you wanna look at the various Supreme Court state of Ohio. This is a law abstract series. Sometimes you'll find ancestors in this. Uh, they publish volumes every year. Here's the Supreme Court. Came, the case came in 1828 from the Common Police Court of Sandusky County, uh, and it involves a guardianship. Mary Perry was a minor. Basically, the court assigned her a guardian, but when she became a certain age, she wanted a different guardian and so forth. And there's land involved. They're always fighting over money. Here's in Lucas County, Ohio. This has to do with a young child who was killed and struck by a train in the neighborhood of Swan Creek Bridge. And the argument has to do with uh, whether it was a public crossing where he was struck or whether he just crossed the tracks at no crossing, in which case the, the uh, railroad wouldn't be liable. But if that's your ancestor or family member that was killed, that is important. And those were in the published state law volume. So revisiting that packet, you need to know who is suing who in a case. Read enough about it to uh, what is the case about. Uh, you want to look at it and see if there's anything genealogically important. You know, does it place your ancestor in a particular community at a certain time? Uh, does it give his, his or her occupation? Does it connect a wife to her husband? Does it name children? Does it name brothers, sisters, cousins, neighbors? That Elizabeth Schoen Mills uh, fan thing, friends, associates, and neighbors, are they... Uh, described in the case. Can you pick those up and use them in other records or other names involved? Who won the case? Sometimes you get all this information and it's hard to determine who won the case because it might have moved from common pleas in the county to the Supreme Court level in the county. And then, of course, list your citations, dates, and so on. So what have we learned today? 
uh, in Ohio, and you'll have to check what Indiana situation is or whatever state you're looking from if they have common pleas records. Uh, in Ohio, common pleas records are very different before 1851 because they include everything. They include probate matters, which are of great importance to genealogy. And uh, sometimes those will packets and, and will ledgers have been moved to probate court, the early ones. That happens in most counties, but in some counties, those early wills are still in the common pleas records in the clerk of court's office. We've learned that there's a variety of causes that end up at common pleas. We learned that case packets may exist, but don't always. Uh, we learned that there are many different types of cases out there, uh, everything from divorces to stray records to the most popular case is are, is over money, debts. You know, one person owes another and they have not paid. Uh, at least 50% of the cases are over debts. The cases can be spread out in appeals. The plaintiff may sue the defendant, then the defendant may come back and sue the plaintiff. So you may have two different cases. Sometimes those case, two cases are combined in one packet. And it tells a little bit about the everyday life of our ancestors between the birth and death date. You know, we get on ancestry and we type in that marriage, birth, death date, whatever, but it's that in-between stuff that really should be of interest to us as family historians. We you learn a lot of history from common pleas records because the early people are named in it. And we get many surprises. We learn things that we did not know. So do not ignore common pleas records. This is my current email address. I'm, I've been trying to switch emails for a couple of years now and still haven't. So I still get email at my old address, but, uh, and I don't get any at the work address that ended the, the day that I retired, but you can reach me at tomneal77 at gmail.com. I'm going to stop sharing the screen and uh, see if there are questions. Are the JP court records still in existence and where? Uh huh. Who knows? Uh, yeah. that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I, I work with a new one in Area Historical Society. We have three or four JP volumes there. Uh, our township has some JP volumes. Sometimes when the, the township records, the township clerk wants, well, they're called fiscal officers now, but when the township officials uh, want to get rid of clean house, get rid of records, I, I've seen them pass J, JP records to the county. And you might find them in there. I've, I've seen some in the recorder's office um, in, instead of the clerk of courts, even. Uh, often they're in museums, uh, but townships still exist in Ohio, and a lot of them still have their own records. It's not an area that genealogists have worked with very much. Um, unfortunately, the, a lot of them have not been scanned or anything like that. So you really have to hunt for Justice of the Peace records. That's the first level of your your lawsuits and so forth yeah. before it goes to the uh, county level of common pleas. There are a couple of people asking, uh, are any of these records online or are they all just physical buried in the clerk's office? Um, for online, we often go to family search now uh, to look at actual record groups. They tend to go with probate records and they've gone through and done marriage and so forth. They are also currently big on deed records and you'll want to use their their uh, beta version of their their search of deeds now because it's it's uh, indexing the handwriting and so forth. But they haven't done a lot of the common pleas journals. Some counties do have common pleas journals on there. Um, so you just have to look. But a lot of it is, uh, it's not hidden in the clerk of court's office, but you have to go visit yeah. or, or Right. Write a letter. Uh, some of them make an attempt to answer or they'll pass it off to the local genealogical society to answer. Um, but uh, I think as time goes on, there'll be more uh, digitization of common pleas records. Um, I don't see many case files online. Uh, they are, are I, I love family search for uh, scanning case packets for probate and uh, I imagine that I ha I've seen like quite a few coroner's records on family search, um, but I, I don't, well, I'm sure there's things on Ancestry right. and all the other sites as well, but uh, I, I don't see a lot of activity at the county websites themselves for putting common pleas records on. The more modern cases are there. I mean, I can look up and 
get all kinds of details about my brother's divorce and that type of thing. But where is the Ohio County record manual online? Um, I would have to look and see, <laughs> yeah. but I, I've used it on the, it's ohiohistory.org. And that's the website of the um, Ohio History Connection it used to be called the Ohio Historical Society. But if you type Ohio uh, Records Manual in Google, mm -hmm. it ought to come up. There are different manuals for townships. There are manuals for um, all different, uh, for municipal municipalities have a record manual. And then the county offices have a record manual, and most commonly records are in the at the county level in clerk or court's office. I have three ancestors who died into state in Hamilton County, Ohio, one in 1812 and then two in 1859. And she was saying that she can follow them in the court journals, but they need to find the distribution list of errors for each one and they're not able to find it. Do you have any suggestions of where to look for those? Since I think it's called Cincinnati Historical Society, it's in a uh, a weird shaped building. <laughs> used to be something I forget what it used to be. Uh, they have a lot of uh, records there. I'm not giving you a very good answer there. Um, I think it's the Cincinnati Historical Society that operates it. Yeah, um, I'll put a link to their like website for the library and archives. University of Cincinnati has quite a few original records as well. Cincinnati had a courthouse fire earlier. There were two courthouses in Cincinnati. One of them didn't burn. Um, there's a real nice um, will abstract book for Cincinnati, quite a thick book uh, that was done that leads you to some some cases uh, for estates. But that 1812 one might be hard to find. Uh, speaking of Cincinnati, uh, somebody was asking, how can I get information from Cincinnati if I live in California? We have a maid now. Yeah. <laughs> when I started doing research in the early 70s, I was still in high school. Uh, we wrote letters and you'd take your vacations and you'd stop at the courthouse. And um, we really have a maid with, with what is available to us online now. Um I guess that's all I can say. You've got to get yeah. you've got to do some work uh, to find things sometimes. If but you, of course, the ancestry family search have put so much online. Uh, so, you know, try the online first. Um, if there's something specific you're looking for, feel free to email Tom or you can email us as well. Um, our email is genealogy at acpl.info. And thing librarians do we like to tell people how to find the things so like i said feel free to email tom or or us and we can give you point you in the right direction uh if there's something specific you're looking for okay uh the next person was wondering what years were the i'm gonna i always struggle with these quadrian well, they're done every four years enumerations what years were those taken specifically for Trumbull County, 1830 to 1860. Uh, there are a couple of peop other people asking about um, these special censuses as well. Um, like, can you find them online? Do they still exist somewhere, like in the courthouses? They're hard to find uh, because they are called different things. Uh, a lot of folks don't realize what they have. Um, basically, you're looking at a list of names and hopefully there's a township noted. Uh, the Wayne County ones, for example, were discovered uh, just a few years ago, and the Wayne County Public Library put them online. Uh, lots of times they'll 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 turn up in it, as you're going through common police packets, and we'll look at that and we'll say that's a list of people. It, it fits the every four years. There was a little book that, booklet that's in a lot of libraries. I think it's called 1807 Butler County Census, and um, a lot of times it's called a census record. And even in the uh, uh, the source, uh, that's not used as much anymore, but the big thick reference book that was put out years ago, they, they in their initial ed edition, they called quadrennial enumeration census records. And Ohio really doesn't have state census, but, <clears throat> but um, 
but they started in the early 1800s uh, and they went into the early 1900s. As far as Trumbull County, you'd want to ask the uh, library there in Warren, Trumbull County Public Library, they have a genealogical staff uh, in their public library. So that would be the first place to ask. Uh, there's unfortunately no great inventory of them. I mean, you can look on the Ohio Genealogical Catalog, catalog online. You can look at the um, Ohio History Connections catalog online for quadrennial enumerations and uh, see what comes up. Uh, Carol Bell tried to do an inventory on her Ohio Genealogical Guide, and that's been, she's been deceased for years, but uh, but I don't, I don't know that anyone's tried to do an inventory of them. Uh, we've got some original ones for certain counties in in our archives at the Ohio Genealogical Society, but um, a lot of, a lot of, uh, they may exist, and people may not know what they were. I, I mentioned that a lot of the Huron County, I think I mentioned the, a lot of the Huron County Common Pleas records, the case packets don't exist anymore. Uh, they had a fire at one time, and and. Uh, and so forth. But if, if you look at the early county histories, sometimes they'll take these quadrennial enumerations in their township histories, and they won't call them quadrennial enumerations, but they'll say like, you know, in 18, uh, 19 residents of a particular township. Well, that 1819 is the fourth year. If you count from 1807 to 1811 to 1815 to 1819 to 1823, that's if you, if you go every four years, there's just a certain year that they took that quadrennial enumeration. So my my thought is that some of these kind of historians, there were more records that existed in the 1880s uh, when they were doing those kind of histories that, that were an offshoot of the centennial celebration of 1876. Each county in Ohio was supposed to do a history. And uh, it doesn't say quadrennial enumeration, but it'll say a list of such and such a township, the residents in 1819. Of course, they could be getting that from a tax roll too, but I think a lot of them are getting it from quadrennial enumeration. So you can tell if there's four people in the family, you know, in a, in a household, uh, there's more people. It's just the, the owner of the house of the land is going to be taxable in the tax list unless, well, that's wrong too, because the kids could have horses and cows and be taxed, but yeah. I'm getting complicated, I know. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Genealogy. Yeah. Could you find adoption records in the common pleas court, or would you find that elsewhere? I haven't seen them in common pleas court. Usually probate. Yeah. Uh, adoption seems to start in the 1870s, really, in Ohio. Before that, they would farm out a child, uh, uh, indentures they're called and you sometimes find those in common police records and in, also in the local justice of the peace journals you'll see indentures uh, but the term adoption doesn't seem to become popular until the 1870s uh, ohio now um, adoptions are open generally so yeah. uh, which is nice uh, the more recent ones you've got to be the adoptee or yeah if the adoptee is deceased prove that you're a descendant but that, that's a, a lot different than it used to be. Where would I find manumission records? Um, there's a project going on now. I think it's through the Ohio History Connection. They got funding mm -hmm. uh, to look for manumission records. Of course, that's been done many times before, but there's still things hidden away in different counties and they're gathering them all in one place. I don't know if it's part of that uh, 10 million names thing is that it might be um, these promotes or if it's something if it's something different but I, I saw I read where they got grant money to do that and they had uh, students basically working in each county uh, to, to review what was at the courts and what were at historical societies so um, I think we're approaching having a real comprehensive list of manumission records that are available for Ohio anyway yeah I know I've for Indiana at least I've seen them um, in, you know, various deed books. Uh, the fun thing is that those are not often or not always included in the deed indexes. So that makes it a little hard to find them. But I have seen them in those deed books before, in Indiana at least. Okay, so we are just about out of time. 
So thank you again, Tom, for such a great presentation. And thanks everybody for joining us. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye. So long.